All right. So this week's videos, um, week seven, if you have watched them, and if you haven't, you should click. You should click about about here, I guess, <laughs> on the web page, right? Um, they're all about the emergence of new, or of re or emergence of new diseases, and I think as you quite nicely put it, there are uh, essentially these two forces. One is there are um, new diseases emerging from mostly from spillover events, and two reemergence from um, um, mostly evolutionary um, consequences. And so, as I sort of looked through this entire list of questions, m there were many, and this was true throughout the course, where people were sort of asking, "What can I individually do about this? You know, how can I avoid?" You know, number one, being exposed to to um, drug-resistant bacteria, for example. How how can my behavior make sure this this problem emerges at a much slower rate? And then the other thing, I actually just came back from a, a meeting in Switzerland, where um, somebody in the audience had a peripheral peripheral reading of of the vaccination evolution of resistance literature and suggested that she should not she decided not to get vaccinated against the flu because she she didn't want to contribute to the evolution of virulence in the flu you're kidding i'm not <laughs> kidding okay. so but i mean this is another you know okay. sort of um, expression of someone taking personal action to try to avoid that problem so what can be said about this what should and what should we not do um, well uh i think the if you don't get infected, you don't play your role in the evolutionary process. So avoid infection. Uh, that's a straightforward one, I think. Uh, if you are infected, then I would say, and I personally would say there are good selfish reasons for doing this as well, only take antibiotics if you really need them. Uh, and that means that it's actually a bacterial infection, not a viral infection. Uh, that, in fact, another day or two you wouldn't cure it anyway, clear it yourself anyway. Yeah, for me personally, you have to, I, I have to be in a pretty bad way now before I'd be interested in taking antibiotics. Mm -hmm. um, that's not just, though, for the community good of not playing my part in spreading resistance. It's also that um, uh, resistance genes get, get into your other bacteria, your uh, symbiote bacteria, and you can build up a nice collection of resistant genes in yourself by taking antibiotics uh, that will be able to be passed to pathogens in due course. Uh, so I think there's lots of good selfish reasons not to do it unless you really need it as well, actually. Right. Um, I think otherwise, uh, broadly speaking, you as an individual have little impact on resistance evolution. We as a community, the decisions that we as a group, uh, we patients and we physicians make, that makes a big difference. That's mm -hmm. a social science issue. How do mm -hmm. we make behaviour change across communities as a whole? And the, what the individual can do is only mm -hmm. as a part of the collective mm -hmm. action, I think. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I think... Um part of what was brought up last week is we don't understand still some of what's behind it. So there's, on the prevention side, uh, there are things like hygiene that are not expensive, mm -hmm. um, that we just don't do. Yeah. Um, hygiene is, is pretty poor and that's consistent in terms of poor hygiene and there's reasons for that. Some of that can be at the policy level where we just don't build in public infrastructure for people to go <coughs> and wash their hands and have access to soap. Some of it's just that people don't do it. Um, on the treatment side, I've had students who really started looking in at least the, the sort of patient end of it, and it's amazing the level of mixed beliefs about antibiotics that they actually serve to like kill pain. They're associated with things like Advil mm -hmm. or ibuprofen or, or Tylenol, that they, they are a painkiller. They're effective because we've seen them work and our mm -hmm. you know, our, um, symptoms have gone down. The other is how many different ways people have gotten around the system, where students here in the U.S. are studying abroad and parents will get access to antibiotics and send them off yeah. um, in some sort of like prevention package to kids, and they will just take them. So there are lots of ways, even in a regulated system, to move around that regulated system. So I, I think that it's, it's very complex how we've gotten here, and I'm not sure that we have a real good understanding yet of how many different ways we got here with the things that would be needed in order to develop the campaigns at all the different levels to make it work. And one of the things I've heard physicians here, the health services people here talk about, is that there's immense pressure from the students for the antibiotics, yeah. 
And maybe they do have a bacterial infection. Maybe, even though it's unlikely, maybe they do. And so the physician's got this concern about you know, the, uh, being responsible if they don't give antibiotics and then it turns out to have a really serious infection issue. Yeah. So there's a pressure from the patients and risk averse physicians, and so before you know it, there's tons of antibiotics being given out unnecessarily. Well, and the, the risk that's salient there is being sued, mm. not yeah. the no. um, resistance. Mm -hmm. And until that becomes much more salient, and until that's really understood, I think we're going to have a real difficulty because that suit that could come from mm. not giving drugs is right there mm. and available and very real in some communities. So self-diagnosis and misdiagnosis is just rampant everywhere in the world. It's not just mm -hmm. in the developed world. So in Tanzania, where we're doing some work, anybody goes into a clinic with a headache or something, it's immediately considered to be malaria. Mm -hmm. And yet it could be some other febrile infection that's causing mm -hmm. it. So that, that misdiagnosis, and that, that we've really got to get the diagnostics much better. Well, in India, where I work, they've, uh, they won't give out, the government at least, won't give out the drugs free unless you've tested positive for malaria that morning. So you oh, go into good. the clinic with malaria-like symptoms, they'll yeah. take a drop of blood and they'll check that. And by the uh, lunchtime, you'll have the answer, whether it's yeah. malaria or something else. The interesting thing about that, though, from a resistance management point of view, if you haven't got malaria, it doesn't matter if you take the drugs. It's not imposing any selections. Yes, absolutely. So I, it's an interesting question as to whether all that performance is worth the effort. Mm. Mm. Interesting. No, I think, uh, so there's another really big area of that, I think, as individuals, we can think about is, and that's the food industry and farm industry, of course, there is an uh, enormous amount of antibiotics and drugs used in, in uh, food production. And that's done for a reason, and that's because we as consumer want to pay as little as money, little money as possible to get our food, and so that puts an enormous pressure on farms to produce food and the best way to add biomass to cows and fish is to throw antibiotics at them. And so I don't know, and obviously, and that's a huge breeding ground for for uh, antibiotic resistance and so I think as individual consumers we probably at some stage hopefully should start thinking about well this is a big concern there are the only ways that we can probably incentivize the main producers in the system is by compensating them for, uh, for, for not using so much drugs and so mm -hmm. I guess you know, organics are, organic food is going to be more expensive for a reason, but uh, uh, I think it's, it might be useful to, to think about the fact that we actually as individual consumers mm. are the ones that at least to some extent influence the massive use of, um, uh, of, of drugs in the farm industry and, and, and as individuals we might be able to, to influence that in, in a different direction. Well, it's a very important point, especially as India and China, particularly China now demands more westernized diets, and we're going to see that increasingly. The problem we have in the next 20 years is not just feeding additional 2 or 3 billion people coming to dinner, but feeding them with diets that we currently here in the developed world eat, and they're going to want to have a similar diet. And, and because we have a model of mass production intensive farms, we already have in place many uh, ways in which to increase productivity, but as you correctly point out, those ways are actually dangerous to the, the greater whole. So how would we avoid that? I think it's really difficult for individuals. Uh, from my own perspective, I think this really requires a, a top-down approach where we can have um, a, a facility which puts in place uh, regulations which reduce the leakage of these antibiotics. Um, and, and you know maybe a greater costs if, if companies are actually uh, leading to this being more distributed in the environment. But we've seen all, we've all seen those papers where people have gone and looked at bacteria in wilderness areas. I don't mm. know there was wasn't there one recently in polar bears where they looked yeah. and found antibiotic resistant bacteria yeah. Yeah, in inside the polar bear in this remarkable sure. wilderness. Sure. Is that just because that they happen to be there? Or is that because of the way the ecosystem works, that those bacteria have come from humans over to there? Well, there was a beautiful s series of science papers a couple of years ago where they showed that the diversity of soil microbes in a regular patch of soil in, in America, you would see huge amounts of bacteria having antibiotic resistance, not because they're getting this as a leakage from our food systems, but because they have to evolve that in the 
ongoing battle that they have with fungi in the soil. Uh -huh. And so it, it really is that strong overlap. I guess it's because there are only so many solutions mm. to antibiotic, antibiotics mm. and we see that overlap for that reason. So you know, more work is needed.